I welcome you all. Thank you for making time this afternoon. A View to Infinity, a retrospective of Nasreen Mohammadi's work, is the first major retrospective that the Kiran Nadu Museum of Art has put together in our three and a half years of institutional history. Central to the exhibition is the NMA's collection of 35 works of Mohammadi, and we are very grateful to all the lenders, individual and institutional, including the family of the artists, who were very kind enough to loan us the Mohammadi's memorabilia. In its already four month long viewership, the exhibition has drawn great reviews, appreciation from the visitors, introducing many to Nasreen's aesthetics for the first time. Visitors to the exhibition have been very intrigued about the persona of Mohammadi and her life as an artist, looking at her comprehensive body of works together for the first time. It is a great pleasure that we welcome you all to the first collateral talk in the series around artist Nasreen Mohammadi's by Kurubina Karode. The series puts forth certain questions and propositions. What are the possible means or methods of accounting and or measuring an artist's life? How important or insignificant is the biographical vis-a-vis -vis an artist's body of works? Does artist's life produce witnesses? If yes, then recording of this shared duration can be as revelatory as well as, the function, as well as function as an acknowledgement and a recursive image in the current material time. Today's talk is one such method to address these questions. It raises anecdotes and personal observations as a way of archiving and narrativizing an artist's life and works. So for those who don't know, Rubina Karode is the director and chief curator of Kiran Nadu Museum of Art and also the curator of this ongoing exhibition. Rubina Karode is an art educator, art historian, and curator with postgraduate specializations in art history and in education. She has been involved in the teaching of Western and Indian art history from 1999 to 2006 at various institutions, including School of Arts and Aesthetics, Jawaharlal Nehru University, the National Museum Institute, Delhi College of Art, and Jamia Media Islamia University in New Delhi. Karode was awarded the Fulbright Fellowship in 2000 and was placed as a visiting scholar at Mills College in California. Since KNMA's inception in 2010, Karode has curated several modern contemporary Indian art exhibitions from the KNMA collection, including Open Doors in 2010, Tanwan Folded in 2011, Crossings in 2012. Her other curated exhibitions include Negotiating Matters, Excavation and Evocations, Human Shah's Terracotta's Sculptures, Living on the Edge, Works of Three Contemporary Artists, The Naked Line, and Pi in Paris. Karode co curated a seminal exhibition titled Tiger by the Tail, from an artist of India Transforming Culture in 2008, showcasing contemporary art by seven women artists of India. At the Women's Studies Research Center, Brandeis University, USA. She has recently curated a major retrospective exhibition of the internationally acclaimed and US based artist printmaker Krishna Reddy at the IJNC in New Delhi. She was also the co curator of the first Fukuoka Asia Trinale in 1998 in Japan. As a critic, Karode continues to contribute thematic essays and reviews to art journals and the Art India magazine. She has written extensive monographs on contemporary Indian artists across generations and for cross cultural collaborations. As Nasreen Mohammadi's student at the Faculty of Fine Arts, MS University of Baroda, and as her neighbor, Rubina Karode came to know Nasreen very closely through many interactions with the artists from 1977 to 1990. Having spent long hours at her studio come home, Rubina will be, today will be sharing the per artist's persona with us through personal anecdotes and rare insights registered by her into the self-evolving discipline of Nasreen with regard to both her art and life. And also Rubina's talk today marks Nasreen Mohammadi's 14th death anniversary. June 3rd, 1968, on the train from Baroda, Nasreen wrote in a diary, hardly able to speak, struggling, digging inner energies, force, strength, and emotion without a word, speak softly. My lines speak of troubled destinies, of death. It goes on to say, and new dimensions out of these layers of existence, of reality, of an unknown strata. 
On another occasion, she said to me, death must also be an experience, like a line drawn and moving from inside the body out. Nasreen's death was untimely. She battled a debilitating disease from the Parkinson's family for almost two decades. But I would say that she lived with the consciousness of death for a very long time. 23 years ago, on this date, Nasreen Mohammadi passed on to a new life while watching the sea at Kihin, near Bombay, where she lies buried in her final makam, or place of rest. It was a desire to be near the sea, keep listening to its rhythmic sound as she lay in peace. This is not unusual in the culture that Nasreen and I come from. If she was around at 76 today, she would, I imagine, be more or less the same. Elegant looking, gentle, very mischievous wink, possessing a really rich and a, and a sense of humor. Her capacity for living and her amazing zest for life was hardly diminished by her illness. Several people sitting here would recall her warm and welcoming gesture of greeting with open arms, generous with her affection, especially for her students. Nasreen's retrospective has intrigued hundreds of visitors the elusive nature of her work, and a relatively lesser-known presence in the history of Indian art, has evoked curiosity about the artist, wanting to read and comprehend her art and life as well. Though Nasreen hasn't been very visible, the few texts produced about her work are intense, profound, and informed, and these would unfold through the series of talks we have planned at KNM in the coming days. In my ongoing formulations, I'm compelled to read Nasreen from and with her own context that does not preclude cultural and religious leanings, just as it equally includes other secular beliefs. Though not strictly a follower of Islam or a believer, she was a believer in the temperament of being philosophical. For me, it is equally compelling to share with you some of the personal moments shared with Nasreen in order to add to the truth of the image we have of Nasreen. So today, with all humility, I endeavor to elucidate how curatorial decisions with regard to the tone and temper of this exhibition have been formed through deeply personal experiences. One of the most privileged and at once challenging ways in which to curate is when you curate something very close to you, almost inseparable from your being. There's this predicament of having to constantly gauge the balance between proximity and distance, objective distance and emotional distance as well, which some has known, with something has, that has been known and experienced so intimately, needs to be astutely poised alongside ethics of caring and curating. One of the memories that remain impressed on my mind when I think of Nasreen is that of Nasreen on the street with us, her students, with her, with her, and she in a white impeccable cotton sari and a black garbage bag in hand, leading us to clear the grounding for the parts. Nasreen was fond of dressing up in elegant cotton saris and plain kurta churidar suits, oxidized silver ornaments, and apart from this, a pension for cleanliness and yoga, and for yoga. I never knew that to follow some form of a discipline. <laughs> It was my first day to college, and we students walked to the foundation class of drawing. While all of us waited for, waited for her with our sketchbooks open and pencils sharpened, Nasreen took us out of the studio and assigned us the task of clearing the litter and the paths around buildings of the fine arts faculty campus. It was extremely important to her that her students sharpen their attention and perceptions of the phenomena around. After almost 30 years, I can almost see that as the central premise of her art and practice. Her work was, I believe, about clearing the path, creating a space for the expression of a clear vision and allowing for a view to infinity. Drawing was not simply a craft or a skill to be imbibed. It was not just about learning to draw, but learning to see. This was a radical position to take in a context and a time where the need for figuration was so prevalent. I'd like to reconstruct for you one of the walks to Sayyidibar across the finance faculty that Nasreen would take us to. I want to do this especially because Nasreen, through her works, her writings, and photographs of her, come, comes across as indeed a shy, reticent person whose, in, whose intensity flowed in abundance through her work. 
However, as a teacher, she often galvanized into a very animated performative mode. And I remember she would suddenly say, stop, and alert us to the falling of a leaf from its branch, or make us aware of a faint sound before it died out, or suddenly take us to the corridor of the studio and make us watch the wheels of an automobile in motion, the circular form of the wheels disappearing under the kinetic force. How often does one meet a teacher who sensitizes us to the minutest of changes happening around us? The presence of breeze, light, movement, and in Anne's presence, in man-made environments. Our drawings came from what we picked up from our surroundings in the form of a stone, a stick, fragments of things that caught our attention, drawing its qualities through sight, touch, feel, and texture, and also seeking connections beyond isolated objects. Sitting in nature surroundings under the open sky, we were made aware of the light falling on forms, often given exercises of capturing tonal values as observed on leaves and trees in our pencil drawings. We were often told to stop after a couple of hours due to the fugitive sunlight and shifting shadows. Though outdoors, we were not learning to compose views of nature as landscapes, but made aware of those poignant details and elements in nature that one may otherwise not even notice, discover, or register. Another of Nasreen's students, Nina Sabnani, says, draw from within our own resources and from experience that life provides. She believed in drawing out our individual capabilities and awakened Nasreen's profundities quite naturally. Amongst her peers and colleagues, Nasreen's art pedagogy was unique. Being born on Teacher's Day was incidental to the fact that she was an extraordinary teacher, a unique and eccentric presence, influenced generations of students at the MSU. My personal association with Nasreen started in more ways, more ways than as a student. Nasreen had grown up in Karachi, then in London, and as such grew up speaking Urdu and English, and spoke only broken spoken Hindi. Now, in order to secure a lecturer's post at the faculty, she needed to clear a Hindi examination that was mandatory, and she was desperately needing a Hindi tutor. With my good score in Hindi, a deal was struck. I would teach her Hindi at her home late evening after college hours, and she would give extra reading time to my drawings. Nasreen had grown increasingly popular amongst her students by then, and it was very difficult for her to turn away any student who landed at her door unannounced. She decided upon a secret code. Three times ringing of the doorbell, and she would let me in. It was the beginning of a long-term friendship and bonding between us. Barely 17 then, as a student, I was intrigued by the persona of Nasreen. At one level, she was simple, humble, and accessible, and at another level, eccentric, complex, and too private a person. As a teacher, she was so different than the rest. Having access to a studio and home revealed another facet to her, facet to me, and, and what I considered an extremely significant aspect of her persona. Her studio was an amazingly spotless clean space, uncluttered and sparse, with a low line drafting table in the center, spotlighted with a low hanging lamp. Nasreen sat on a ground stool and worked in the calm of the night. Her drafting table, tools, and, and the stool are all displayed in the studio space, which is recreated in this exhibition, by the way. With a promise to devote half an hour after drawing for lessons in Hindi, she would get totally immersed and there would hardly be an exchange of a word or even a glance. She would be completely oblivious of me, and I would find it rather punishing to be there for more than two hours, quite restless and stuck, unable to comprehend why I was there at all. My family never objected. They valued a teacher-student dialogue. But for me, Nasreen worked in her solitude. The only voice she listened to was of Pandit Dhin Sentoshi. The conversation began while she walked me down to my house at night. She would often stop and draw my attention to the shadow of a small plant across the staircase or the lines of a railing on the wall. The shadows were inseparable from the form. As months passed, gradually I started enjoying being there, even the silence, in a space for self-reflection. Nasreen taught me that the world was too much with us to the day and it was important to withdraw from the material world, something like a Sufi's inward retreat, 
And not unlike the stories of saints or prophets choosing to retreat into the cave for meditation or enlightenment. In fact, the same studio like, was like a Sufi's den, a restorative space with great vibrations, few possessions. Most of it remained neatly stacked away in carpets. It was the purity of the space that one experienced. In life as in art, she arrived at such a space through acts of omission, renouncing figural devices, narratives, objects, large scale, color, on 30th March 1970, she wrote, A spider can only make a web, but, but it makes it to perfection. Coming originally from her readings of the Sufi, the lines that she did not trans transcribe were, The web is as the message, woven from what it is transformed within. The extent of the message is not important, just as the strength of the web is not in its size. Nasreen's works remained modest in size, intimately linked to the movement of her hand on paper, holding as if the image in the palm of her hands. She excessively mopped the floor of her home, sometimes several times in a day. The daily rituals of cleansing the floor was a prerequisite, almost in the manner of the rituals of ablutions or acts of cleansing before each prayer is offered to connect with the unseen. She probably could not get rid of this obsessive compulsive streak in her. But in a way, this worked in favor of the practice as acts of preparedness for a self-rewarding discipline with regard to both her art and life. She often talked about emptying the center. She wrote in her diary, 15th November night, year not known, the empty mind receives, drain it, squeeze the dirt hard, so that, it so that it receives the sound with a flash. The Sufis say, empty the center. The ego should go. Only then can you become a receptacle for pure light and knowledge. I used to watch her endlessly draw intricate lines. Sitting upright, using her glasses, with the help of precision instruments, she used to drag the pencil across the surface ending the line at a point with a precise twirl. The movement of the hand was controlled and she would be in full concentration. Even a slight aberration was unforgivable and she would simply tear the drawing or leave it half done, passing it over to students for rough use. Her studio converted into an exhibition space when she wished to share her works with her students and peers. The works were displayed on the pristine floor in an L-shaped line and each one of us was to enter in a line, engage the works, and exit, exit in a line, almost without uttering a word. Nasreen believed in staying connected. When she would be away for medical help or treatment to Mumbai or Bangalore, she would write letters at least to students who were in constant touch uh, and her friends. Her diaries, the pages that have been already published, draw our attention to mundane entries, work-related reminders, observations, mathematical numbers, and entries that are deeply philosophical, one leading to the other or the other way around as well. The page of the, pages of the diaries are almost like inscriptions of life on art or art inscribed on her life. Often she wrote things and then blotted out areas by plotting her dense lines on her words. There is hardly any bitterness or grudge expressed towards any individual, peer, family member, or the art world that had paid little, little heed to her art practice. And she remained, while she remained outside the mainstream, her battles were all with herself, and at times, perhaps, with an unseen divine force. The often used words in her diaries that we come across are despair, concentrate, birth, and decay. Some entries in her diaries read as abbreviated notes, single phrases, sometimes a para, but they were her private possessions, retrieved only after her death from her apartment in Baroda. What was also found with them was a book on Eva Health, and the fragility of the lives of both these women artists must have struck a chord in her. Eva Hess died really young, and much in the same vein as the stream. Eva wrote, Art is in a sense, a center. I'm interested in solving an unknown factor of art and an unknown factor of life. My life and art have not been separate. The capacity for living intensified. 
Nasreen and I often used to leave for college together, and the moment I used to greet her, she would say, it all totals up to number nine. And I would really be surprised, what does she mean by that? That it all totals up to number nine, and then she would say, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So basically, it would be a number nine total of what she was wearing. Okay, and it had to be always number nine. Number nine was an obsession, maybe a lucky charm, but I always said to myself, knowing her, it must have had, it must have some deeper significance. Even if I asked, I was, I wondered then if the spirit would be revealed. Let me tell you more about the significance of the number nine for her. Like friends do, we gave each other books. In keeping with both our eclectic leanings, I recall receiving from her the Dhammapada Buddhist teachings, a book on Zen gardens, and a precious less known book called Sufi by Lali Matya. All of these are quite integral to her life. At the time, there were very, very few women writing on Sufism. Iranian American writer Lali Matya elaborated on the mystique of numbers. Where she has drawn, where she drew a table of numerical correspondences that highlight numbers, their geometrical form, their meaning in the macrocosm and its features, and the corresponding attributes of the microcosm, all along with its mathematical attributes. Now, this is a complex chart, but I will still read it. For instance, number zero, shunya, stands for divine essence and has no mathematical attributes. Number one is the creator in, micro, in, in macrocosm, the one primordial, permanent, eternal, and in mathematical attributes, the point and origin of all numbers. Number two is intellect. In macrocosm, innate and acquired, while in microcosm, it is body divided into two parts, left and right, and mathematical attributes are one half of all numbers counted by it. And the third is soul, four is matter, and it goes on. Number five in macrocosm represents nature, ether, fire, air, water, and earth, which are the five elements. And in microcosm represents five senses, sight, hearing, touch, taste, and smell. Number six represents the body, above, below, front, back, right, left. Six, and in microcosm, six powers of motion in six directions. Up, down, front, back, left, and right. Number nine in the macrocosm represents beings of this world. And in microcosm, nine elements of the body. Bones, brain, nerves, veins, blood, flesh, skin, nails, hair. And it goes on till it comes to 360 number. Number of solar days, number of veins in the body, and number of degrees in a circle. And I'm sure... <laughs> Nasreen had engaged this fully. It also states that it is through geometry that the personality and character of numbers is revealed, providing still other means of coming to know the cosmic processes of nature. The goal is that from which all things proceed, the invisible, so-called unseen force God, whose will brings into being the intelligence. From out of the will, an intelligence appears, the soul in its unity, from the soul are all distinct natures, which in turn generate composed bodies. Thus one sees that a thing can be known only if one knows what is superior to it. The soul is superior to nature, and it is by that that nature can be known. The intelligence is superior to the soul, and it is by that the soul can be known. And finally, intelligence cannot lead back, cannot but lead back to the divine essence that is imperceptible talking about the mystical dimension of geometry. At the time when Nasrin introduced me to Lale Bhaktiya, I was also simultaneously reading Lale. And I mentioned this here, as I recall something he wrote then that I find is so true, so much true of Nasrin. Ghalib, by the way, talked about the acceptance of adversity as but a facet of the divine immanence. His philosophical outlook gave him the strength to transmute personal loss into a splendor of agony. He wrote, Branj se kugar hua, insa ko mit jata hai branj, mushkile mujh par padi itni ke asa ho gai. 
The translation would be, if man is habit to pain, pain does not remain. So many hardships fell on me that they did not remain. Rale really meant the act of experiencing to an ontological end in itself to be savored in spite of the existence of pain. He wrote in Urdu, and I present its English, its English translation here. O heart, consider every sorrow's song to be a consolation. For one day, this body will die without sensations. Precisely what he believed was that amidst the greatest tribulation, the zest for life must prevail. And if one was to too shallow a receptacle to absorb the range of experiences life could offer, one must enhance its sensitivity to compensate for its capacity. And that is what I saw in the stream. This was so true of the stream and the ailing body. I wondered how a person who could not walk straight actually pulled those straight lines with tremendous control on paper. The Sphinx believed in training our mind and body through rigorous practice of yoga over the years was so internalized that this would reflect in many other ways. I recall standing with her, contemplating her words, all stacked against the wall. After a spell of silence, she would ask, how is it? And I, who could not fathom anything about the work, would end up saying, the lines are so neat and precise. And she would smile and say, could you sense yogic concentration? But underlying this moon stream of events and meditation, I began to sense the restlessness and the turmoil. It was the first time that I was witnessing the life of an artist so closely. And to comprehend the inner storm that rages within the artist, a storm of dissatisfaction with the self and the cruel urge of perfection. There were no external pressures. The compulsions were all from within. For Nasreen, the pain in the soul both countered and was redoubled due to her bodily afflictions. The twitching of the mouth and the involuntary shaking of her limbs had taken away control, had taken control over her body. Her composure and elegant demeanor was now slipping away with signs of pain, prolonged exhaustion, becoming more and more visible. Unlike artists who chose to express and articulate the anatomy of pain in their imagery, and I can only at the moment think Frida Kahlo, who instantly comes to my mind with a broken spinal column, a suffering body, and the gradual loss of it bit by bit. Nasri never spoke about her illness or the pain. When I first met her, she was my teacher and mentor. Even when we became friends, she always remained a source of inspiration. Gradually, our wounds traversed, and I became a quiet carer and confident. confidant. The awe and distance disappeared and was replaced by intimacy and a silent complicity with each other's suffering, each other's pain. Her suffering could not be hidden anymore. She deteriorated, she deteriorated with every death in her family. First her brother, then her father, then her young nephew, and then the pain of her younger brother and artist Alkaf also suffering from the same illness. She was devastated. As I was, having lost my father, who I was closest to. I recount the letter she wrote to me then from Bombay. She said, even storms have their own functions to perform. Nasreen hardly ever spoke directly about her work. She would bring forth her reservations about the word abstract and whether art would ever be abstract. It cannot happen in speaking no while in a vacuum. And because of Nasreen's total absorption of, absorption of herself in her work, one reads the work as one reads the person, much in an archetypical manner. This is, it was also that, <clears throat> what, I, what I felt the strongest was, that there is some connection with this belief in the unseen, that comes into, into our orientation in Islam, much in our formative years. That you start articulating the unseen, you start connecting with the unseen, you start believing in the unseen. The absent one is present everywhere. This becomes something that you live with. There is a relationship of receiving the unseen to invocation, incantation, repetition. Hence, there is an interesting relationship that is built between the manifest and hidden in all aspects of life and living. <clears throat> the Sufis believed 
that the notion of the cosmos was that it was both, both manifest and hidden, both known and veiled. The mundane and everyday must lead to a higher state of consciousness. All realization has to happen through the manifested world. The physical body is just a tool to be readied for a spiritual ascent, where the material body can be left behind and one can almost exist without it. Nusreen's commitment to abstraction is inspired by spiritualities as much as it is inspired by Kandinsky, his thesis on the spiritual in art, by Mondrian's world based on theosophy, the vertical and horizontal forces, the manner which is ethereal and floating world that professed an ascent from the ground, and in fact, a line from the Upanishad that she would quote, the eternal cannot be grasped by the transient senses or the transient mind. All of these align themselves to a non-representational ethics and aesthetics. From the very beginning of, from the very beginning, the orientation to Islam is to the belief in the unseen. In the absence of an externalized form, abstraction becomes the means of articulation. And one articulates through numbers, geometry, invocations, attributes, qualities, incantations, reverberations. The notion of the cosmos is that it is both manifest and real. The seeker has to move from sensible forms to intelligible forms. It is to the mundane and everyday that these higher states of consciousness are attained. Death in Islam or in its Sufic interpretation is also a celebration. Both availing and unveiling. For when one is veiled from the mortals, one is unveiled to the unseen. I end this presentation with reckoning, with reckoning something that occurred in one of my visits to Australia. As it happened, I was with Nasreen then, though this is not so pertinent to what I'm going to recount. It was a trip to the family graveyard with Nasreen to offer prayers at my father's grave. I heard my grandmother say, this is going to be my place next to your grandfather. And I curiously asked her, where would my place be there? Death is a reminder, an invocation of both an absence and a presence. Nasreen for me today remains a presence much more concrete in her absence. Thank you. I am one of the many students which Nasreen was a great. Uh, she was not a teacher only, she was a mentor, guide, everything. You would confine everything to her. We were like babies when we entered. And she it was like babies in her lap all around. And she mentioned she used to make us clean the floors and studios and dormitories and everything. We didn't know, we used to get a little irritated, but later we came to know how much she was making us close to the environment. And many, many, many personal experiences one has with the borough, with the nursery, as every student has. I remember once that uh, while teaching, drawing, that we, we, we had, she, she would never hurt, she would be silent. Then we had some kind of argument. Next day, I didn't come to faculty or some other reason. But she reached to the uh, hostel as J. Hall 106. Means it was like shocking that Nasreen was like that. Also, when the narrative movement in Baroda was so high, and she is the one which is very different, abstract. Like we were all into figurative and all kind of things. Where with was heavy narrative movement. And this was Nasir who was so unparalleled and very, very, very sensitive, very many, many experience. She made us to draw totally, means drawing means lot, and meaning of drawing was very different than one would know and read and see about. I remember taking me and many of us to Kamati Park and museum would make her to sit there for months in that heat and we visit every time mornings 8 to 12 she would do as she would visit till you finish and learn that perspective and each detail of the museum. It took months to learn but she would be so persistent. That's what Nasreen, Nasreen, Nasreen was like mother to Nasreen was well whatever problems you have to confide to her and the answer will be here with the silence and she had. That's what 
many, many things what I should remember, but it's wonderful to be a student. I just want to add that uh, there were many, many things about her personal that could, that could have been said. And in fact, um, it, uh, the Patayan Post Office Road, where she lived, every person knew her, whether it was a sweeper or a rickshaw guy or the neighbor next door. And everybody knew that she would stop, she would walk and pause, walk and pause, and it almost took her an hour to cross a row, a row of ten houses. That was the street. She would, she would instantly stop because she would have seen or noticed something and then she would get lost. Okay? And then suddenly she would remember she's in the middle of the road, you know, and there are things, people going around and she would, yes, oh, yeah, yes, oh. she would start her normal conversation. And her neighbor, I, 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 several times I was there and she would in the morning open the window which faced her neighbor and she would start with, good morning, how are you, you know, and the neighbor would start a conversation and in the middle of the conversation, the screen would blank out. Okay, she would blank out and she would be completely involved, you know, she would, she would be chasing a shadow or she would be noticing something else, you know, and, she, and the neighbors would be waiting for an answer. It took them, took them some, some time to realize this Nasreen phenomena, which was that she was there and yet not there, you know, and it was a practice to do this every day. She would open the window, talk to the neighbors and then back out. Okay, and get completely, she was totally mindless of the fact that she was in a conversation. And there are many such instances that, uh, that really revealed her personality, which was so much about, she was so totally immersed and absorbed in what she was doing. And she had this obsessive identification with her, with her art and what she was really pursuing, you know. It was, her art and life was almost inseparable, they were just completely one. And um, I didn't think right today to talk about really her, uh, her last um, last one or two years when she was really um, uh, when she was really ailing uh, very much. But she needed to work because work was her uh, healing, and she had to heal herself. And um, she was not even able to mop the floors, so she would feel very bad about it. And often I used to do that for her. But uh, more importantly, she would want to sit down on a drafting table, again, upright, stage of preparedness. And then she would call me and say that, um, she would not tell me what's happening to her, but she would tell me that, can you just tie this scarf very, very hard around my mouth? Because she feared dribbling on her drawings. And I was, I was so, uh, I, I went through that phase where I, I really was uh, uh, very worried about her and I would, uh, after that I would sit there just knowing that um, she would need me and she would be totally important. Once or twice I think she dribbled on her paper on a drawing and she sobbed and sobbed and sobbed. She just sobbed. It was, she would not stop sobbing. And, um, I, um, again, as I said in my, in my, this paper that I don't know how, this is, this is the predicament that you know a person so closely and what should be revealed and what should not be revealed. But I would like to say, because I said in the beginning that she lived with the consciousness of her death. And there were one or two instances when she called me because she was leaving for Bombay and she wanted a taxi to the airport and I want, I needed to drop her off. And she told me. And I never see, I always saw her smiling, even when she was in pain. That was the only time when I saw her completely molten. And she told me that if, in case, if I don't return, because she used to leave her keys with me, keys of her apartment with me. She said, in case I don't return, I would like you to do something for me, which is to destroy things that I don't want others to see. And uh, I being, you know, I would always tell her that, no, you will certainly come back and you'll come back with a you know, bigger smile on your face. And she did, both times. And it was really strange that I was given a call to Delhi for an interview at Jamia. And I came here in 
1990, April end. And I stayed back for 10 days, and that's the time when she passed away. Um, so, but, um, but so there, uh, I, I, her work was everything to her. Her work was everything. She lived for it. She completely was, and when I, um, I didn't today try to analyze her works here as I see them, but in this room, uh, I have a work which is a single work on the wall, and um, from her very nature based abstractions and geometric abstractions, when you come into these rooms, you start seeing lines, you know, which become airy, ethereal, floating, you know, suspended, and they're moving, and they have no. They have no relation then with the ground. They have been, they've lifted themselves from the ground, almost like a spiritual ascent or an emancipation or a liberation from that mundane world. And at one point, in one of the works, you just see indented lines, which have no body, no matter. They completely evacuated of it, you know, and that perhaps was the point of emptiness or nothingness or total receptivity, perhaps, that she was talking about. So I um, have all those things to talk about, and maybe in the next um, talk I will focus on the work. Today was much more about, uh, I felt that I should share these uh, little secrets, little things about her that I, because of knowing her so intimately and so closely. Um, what I admire most about Nastrini is her incredible capacity for love. Um, it seems like I don't know anybody who knew Nasri who doesn't feel that they had that one special relationship with her which nobody else had. Absolutely. We all feel I was closer to her than anyone else could possibly be. Mm -hmm. And I think this is just uh, you know just one way that Nasri expressed herself, this incredible capacity for love. And I think for each one of us who knew her well, there, there's a story, there's a story to tell. Mine, perhaps, is a very harsh one. Um, I used to sit with Nash Nasreen while she drew. And we, we again, became very close because she was never my teacher. Mm -hmm. I was in the area, but she never told me. Uh, while Nasreen was drawing and her lines were becoming elliptical, yes. I would tell her, Nasreen, don't let it become a circle because when it becomes a circle, you will die. And she would, she would tell me, you're a bad girl. <laughs> but, you know, but I, I could feel like, I, could, I felt close enough to her to feel through her joy where her life was going. And I think that's what made it possible for me to say that to her. Um, and like I said, we each have this feeling. feeling that nobody else could be closer to her than I was. And that is saying something very important. I think for me it was she her life was the best example to learn uh, how work was a therapy for her. Mm -hmm. um, she had difficulties coming at uh, very very serious difficulties uh, she was encountering almost on a daily basis. But work became her therapy, her meditative process, mm -hmm. and it was healing her. Yes. It was healing her. There were various medicines which were sort of layering her body, whether it's Yomkati or Ayurvedic or yoga or a kind of meditative force, she would kind of uh, put on herself to center herself. But I think it was the work, being able to work, which became her healer. You know, this motif of the angel and how you, because you ended with saying you, she that much alive for you. I was wondering if you wanted to build on that and Share with your you told me about uh, this, when you think about death and about how it happens uh, when, when one is buried. Yeah, I think that um, it, it, death is quite an elaboration in Islam, actually, because um, in the way that things are done, you know, it's, it's much more uh, a grand procession than what, what marriage. Okay, in the way that the body is prepared, ready, then taken to the ground. Even the the person who actually digs the grave is supposed to um, is a special person because he has to create a house 
an architectural house, really. And um, unlike what Hindi movies show that you just go down like this, you will actually start on the sides, okay? And the space that is created is for the dead, for the dead to be, there should be at least that much space that the dead person can sit up and be in a conversation with the angel. Okay, because the idea is that once you leave the material world, this amount of space, you are then visited. Okay, and you are in dialogue and conversation when in the grave. Okay, and that is also the reason why when you visit graveyards, there's a small notion you never you never tend to forget that there is this is a place where the person is invisible and yet there. Okay. And in, the, in, in Sufism, there is a celebration when a Sufi dies. The place that he dies, the den or the space that he dies, is turned, is turned into almost like a wedding place. For the simple reason that they say there are 70,000 ways between here and there. Okay? And the Sufi talks about that these ways are, you know, basically 70,000 70, ways between light and darkness. Till you reach that, okay, and the and you know the Sufi takes on the journey to keep unveiling till he comes to the state where there is only just a parda, they say, a way between you and the creator, and when that unveils, you become one. Okay, so unveiling and veiling is an extremely important, uh, what to say? It's a it's a very important premise in Sufism, and. This whole thing about visiting the graveyard, living, you know, you're, you're, the living is with the dead, okay, and it's almost like you live with it so that you, you are always conscious of it and you are always remind, reminded of the separateness from the, from the divine essence. You live with the separateness, okay, and you overcome it also. It's one way. So there, is a very, there are very interesting things when you really talk about this dimension in both in Islam and in its, uh, in its Sufi principle. And um, when I t told about, um, when I talked about the stream, the stream had these, like, like Sasha just said, this whole idea of that fascinating is a fascination with it's forever. And um, there were several instances when she did invoke in different ways. And it was not at all, uh, it was not at all gloomy. The conversation was not at all gloomy. It was not about uh, the, so much the fear of death. It was not so much about the fear of death. To just, uh, to end on a happy note, I must say that every time that I go in these rooms, <laughs> I, ex I experience the sleep. I feel that she is, she is there. Because every time I look at something and I'm reminded of some conversation or the other, and almost when I'm looking at her or in her studio, sitting there alone and listening to Bhim Sen Joshi, and I'm, I'm reminded of the first time when I sat there and I was thinking, what do I do here watching, watching her? Thank you very much. <laughs>